Hello and welcome to our latest webinar on heart rate variability and monitoring with MovieSense. As always, we're just going to just give another couple of minutes to let everyone make their way into the webinar and be prepared for it. So if you're already here and you want to just grab a quick coffee, it, now's your time to do it. All right, thank you once again for joining us. And our topics for today are getting to know movie sense, the background of ECG and, and the basics of heart rate variability measurements. We'll also talk a little bit about heart physiology in there as well. Interpreting a measurement and then actually the process of attaching the ECG move forward, which is obviously our device for capturing this data. And then we have a, a guest uh, session of best practice with Professor Dr. Andreas Schwertfeger, who will go through uh, some of his experiences with the ECG Move 4, and then we'll have a Q&A session. So as we go through the presentation, please feel free as questions come to mind to put them in the chat section, and that will then give us some time to, to contemplate the answers and get them to you in the Q&A section at the end. So MovieSense spun out of an interdisciplinary research group that was studying the relationship between stress, uh, physical and mental performance. Um, and there was a realization uh, during this time that there weren't enough quality tools to really cover this context in an ambulatory environment. And thus MovieSense was born out of a lot of the research done during this time. And we're headquartered in Karlsruhe, Germany, with 17 employees now. So we're, we're growing almost every webinar. The key thing that we really focus on is understanding the broader context. So it's solutions for multimodal ambulatory research. So on, I guess, the left-hand side of a circle, which you know, if you can have a left hand of a circle, we, we have our objective data. So we our physiological sensors that study things like physical activity, autonomic state, sleep, cognitive function, and analysis of that data. And then on the right-hand side, we have the subjective data, which is the things like experience sampling and mobile sensing, getting, getting context from the actual participants themselves as to what the physiological data might mean, or just getting context from the participants throughout their day-to-day -day life. And we are one of the few companies that can offer completely interactive assessment, so having physiological uh, changes of state trigger questionnaires so that you can get additional subjective data. So we can blend the two quite beautifully and synchronize the data sets very well. And our ongoing mission is to provide the optimal equipment to every researcher for conducting ambulatory assessment studies. We are capable of developing systems for ambulatory assessment and experience sampling. So that's mobile sensor systems of you know, physiological sensors, biosignal processing and algorithms related to physical activity, ECG, heart rate variability, galvanic skin response, breathing, sleep, 
and software for smartphones and tablets and web technologies. So we have a very broad base. And we really focus on ambulatory assessment because the real-time assessment gives a higher precision. You're capturing the actual moment when it's happening. You're not getting the retrospective biases of the participant. You can actually get outside of the lab and assess people in everyday life, not just when they're in the laboratory environment and in an unfamiliar setting. You can see the changes over time and you can also broaden the context so you can be capturing a lot of different data. So psychology, physiology, behavior, context by using the right combination of tools. And our favorite one is the interactive assessment. So utilizing queries based on physiology, behavior and context. So using triggers that occur based on the participants' actual activities to then ask them further questions and get more context data. So the MOVE4 forms the heart of our product range. So every component that's within the MOVE4 is within all of our sensors. So 3D accelerometer, 3D gyroscope, air pressure sensor, uh, proximal temperature sensor, and it has excellent activity recognition and energy expenditure measurement when combined with our analysis software. And these, these components are within every single sensor. So when we move over to the ECG MOVE4, what we're doing is we're taking everything that's within the MOVE4 and adding a single channel of ECG. And with the light MOVE4, we're adding five channels of light. So, and then that's really excellent for things like sleep analysis and behavioral monitoring, circadian rhythm studies and so on. Then we have the EDA MOVE4. So we're adding a single channel of electrodermal activity measurement to the sensor which is really good, it's a, a nice exosomatic method. We've done a previous webinar on that, which I'd, I'd invite anyone interested to check out. And the, the real value out of all of this comes from the calculation of the secondary parameters that are available within our data analyzer. You know, it's a lot of excellent validated algorithms and a really convenient way to analyze your study. And then last, but certainly not least, is our experience sampling platform or ecological momentary assessment platform, Movies and Success, which is a platform for ambulatory assessment, questionnaires, interventions, and so on. And whilst it can operate completely as a standalone device, it can also be integrated with our physiological sensors. And you can find more information on that in our other webinars on sensor triggering and interactive ambulatory assessment. And now getting over to, I guess, our, our feature product for, the, for this webinar, which is the ECG Move 4, our ECG and activity sensor, which I've touched on briefly. It's got excellent detection. So 1,024 hertz, so that's 1,024 samples per second. So we're getting over millisecond accuracy with our R peak detection, which, as we'll come to talk about in a moment with heart rate variability, is really important that you have an accurate measurement. Other key elements of the device, it can be used with either disposable electrodes, as sort of pictured here, or a chest belt. And the chest belt is really comfortable for long-term measurements. You can actually do very long-term measurements. We say that you can do at least 10 days. Uh, we guarantee at least 10 days of recording. Uh, I've personally recorded 21 days, which I don't recommend because it just gives you this gigantic ECG file, which cripples your computer whenever you try and open it up. And now I guess let's get into the, the heart of the matter. Oh, painful, but I couldn't help myself. Arousal and conduction of arousal in the heart. Now, the heart is a hollow muscle and it consists of four different compartments or cavities. You can divide the heart into two halves in two different ways. So either along the longitudinal axis, dividing it into right and left hearts, and also along the horizontal plane, dividing it into atria and ventricles. So looking at the path of blood from its return from the body, blood enters the right atrium through the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. From there, it enters the right ventricle through the three valve leaflet, which is you know, the tricuspid valve. From there, the blood is pumped through the pulmonary valve via the pulmonary artery into the lungs. And after oxygenation, the blood returns to the left atrium and then enters the left ventricle through the mitral valve or mitral valve. No idea how you say it properly. From there, it then says goodbye through the aortic valve on its long journey through the body. Now, the dividing wall between the left and right ventricles is called the septum. And the cells of the conduction system are embedded in the muscle tissue of the right atrium and especially in the septum. 
So this is important. These are not nerve pathways, but specially modified muscle cells. In addition to conduction, there are also cell structures with pacemaker capabilities, which we'll just touch a bit more later on. So now comes the real trick. So how is excitation generated in the heart? Because cardiac cells have a stable resting potential. Nothing would actually happen on its own without some sort of form of excitation. So that's where pacemaker cells come into it and they have a non-constant resting potential. So as soon as the resting potential is reached, the voltage starts to drift back to the excitation threshold and finally triggers the excitation of the pacemaker cell by itself. This property is called autorhythmia. And as already mentioned, such cells are mainly concentrated in the excitation sensors and thus enable the regular contraction of the heart. So the actual forming the actual heartbeat. So there's various excitation sensors within the heart. So we've got the sinus node, which has a normal frequency of sort of 60 to 80 beats per minute. And that's primary excitation sensor. It, it, it focuses on the contraction of the entire heart. Then we have the AV node, which is a normal frequency of 40 to 50 beats per minute. And that's a secondary excitation center. So it, it's focused on the contraction of the actual chambers. And then the HIS bundle or the HIS bundle which was a normal frequency of 20 to 30 beats, which is a tertiary excitation center. So th there is redundancy within the system to ensure blood circulation when a higher excitation center fails. So that's why th there's, th nature has its own sort of systems that it builds upon and it builds redundancies within them. And the sinus node excitation superimposes the other. So the SA node will determine the speed for the rest of the heart and then the secondary and tertiary excitation sensors are sort of more uh, are, are slower. They're, they're sort of contained within that. Now, the sinus node is influenced by nerves and hormones. So it's under the influence of both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. So the sympathetic nervous system so is, is always active under load. It increases the discharge frequency and it's primarily driven by the transmitter noradrenaline. Whereas the parasympathetic nervous system is more active at rest, it's frequency lowering and works off of acetylcholine as its neurotransmitter. So adrenaline and noradrenaline, which as hormones reach the sinus node via the bloodstream have basically the same effect on the, on the heart. So here we have a, a diagrammatic representation of the autonomic nervous system, both the sympathetic and parasympathetic side, and how they interact with the various organs throughout the body. So generally the sympathetic nervous system is the gas pedal, so it's the accelerator. It, it runs on noradrenaline, is the, is the trigger for it taking hold. And it's focused in the spine, like so in the sympathetic trunk here, whereas if you look over at the parasympathetic side that's acting sort of as the braking system, it, it's more at the extremity, so both in the sacral area of the spinal column and up at the vagus nerve and in, in, in the brain itself. So that's acting as the braking mechanism, which is using acetylcholine as the main neurotransmitter of action. So here we have a picture of both efferent pathways, so both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And you can see how the adrenergic nerve cells produce noradrenaline as a neurotransmitter in this particular situation and finds its way into the target cell of the heart. Whereas cholinergic nerve cells produce acetylcholine as its neurotransmitter finding its way onto a different location within the heart. Okay, so if we all just get strapped in, uh, we'll try and navigate through these next couple of slides uh, as efficiently as possible. So the effect of the sympathetic nervous system. We have noradrenaline docking to the beta-1 receptors right here, okay? This causes an activation in this zone here. So it activates the adenyl cyclases. This produces more cyclic adenosine monophosphate. So that's a derivative of ATP. And that opens the sodium channels and also increases the current of the pacemaker cells in the IF. So thus the, the pre-potential increases faster and reaches the threshold of depolarization earlier and the frequency increases. So you can see the, the change here. The faster the sodium inflow, 
and the changing that it's a, that occurs to the actual wave from here. So the the membrane potential to to trigger the electrical charge of the heart. And so noradrenaline requires a second messenger, which is why it's affected slower. So it requires that cyclic uh, adeno monophosphate, adenosine monophosphate. Sorry. And so it has a slower effect. It's you know, approximately 10 seconds. Whereas the parasympathetic nervous system, we have acetylcholine docking to the muscarinic receptor M2. The M2 directly opens the potassium channels. IK is enlarged, so these, the current of the potassium is enlarged. And this lowers the maximum diastolic potential. And then it takes longer to reach the threshold. So it inhibits the adenylyl cyclases, so less cyclical adenosine monophosphate is produced, sodium channels are closed, and IF is reduced. So whilst the second messenger is involved, this effect actually occurs without its influence. So the effect is substantially quicker. So less than one second, you can see the effect of the parasympathetic nervous system. Like The braking mechanism acts far more efficiently and powerfully than the, the gas pedal, in, as in the same way in cars. So neurotransmitters and heart rate variability. Sympathetic tends to increase the heart rate. This neurotransmitter is noradrenaline, and it can only control slowly. It's a slow modulation. The parasympathetic, on the other hand, lowers the heart rate and works from the neurotransmitter acetylcholine and can regulate very quickly. It's a fast modulation. So respiration itself has an influence on the heart rate of, of, of a person. So as we're inhaling, our heart rate increases, and as we're exhaling, it decreases. And respiratory sinus arrhythmia sort of accounts for, for this element. So, so during inhalation, the pressure in the thorax lowers and increases blood flow of the venous blood back into the heart. So we have a stronger filling of the heart the beat volume increases as well, and also the blood pressure. So, so blood pressure, you can calculate by stroke volume, multiplied by heart period, and multiplied by total peripheral resistance, so the total peripheral resistance of the, the veins. So atrial receptors detect stretch brain bridge reflexes and increase the heart rate, whereas baroreceptors in the aorta detect elevated blood pressure, baroreceptor reflexes, and, and it reduces the heart rate. So the amplitude of the RSA results from the interaction of these two effects. So you, you have the inhalation, the blood pressure increasing, the bain bridge reflex coming through, heart rate increasing, and then there's the baroreceptor reflex sort of working against that heart rate lowering. And this is, this is respiratory sinus arrhythmia in two PowerPoint slides. Now, ECG, heart rate and heart rate variability assessment. So ECG is it's a really powerful tool. I mean, it's every hospital utilizes this as, you know, to detect things like cardiac arrhythmias, warning rhythms, other sort of anomalous heartbeats. It's very insightful into your current state of health and also projecting into the future. Heart rate is, is a slightly lesser um, relevant metric it can be used in training control so if you're trying to do things like zone two training where you're not in, you know your heart rate is staying at a relatively stable level like above your resting rate but not into a, an area where you're sort of producing too much lactic acid it can be very helpful so it can be used in connection with activity monitoring assessment of performance and fitness and heart rate variability is is a really powerful tool like it's it's used in a lot of things so stress recovery overload and, and it gives a beautiful insight into the status of the vegetative nervous system. So limited heart rate variability is a reliable predictor of sudden cardiac death after a heart attack. So variability is, is a good thing in this context. In top glass sport for training control, it's really good for elite athletes are using this more and more now to determine when they need to cut back on training because these are the sort of people that will generally train themselves into the ground if they can. They need people there to tell them, no, no, it's time to pull it back. And these are good metrics that are utilized for controlling that sort of the, that battle between the coach and the player. So normal heart rate variability, it, it's, it's about flexibility about adaptability. So a high variability means your heart's basically pumping when it needs to. It's not under duress, it's not stressed, it's not tense, it's not 
fighting off some sort of threat. So it's basically a capability of adapting to a situation. So you want that flexibility. You want the adaptability. It means you're relaxed. It means you're physically fit. And it's a reduction of negative emotions. Whereas decreased heart rate variability means your adaptability is restricted. So you have a higher increased uh, risk of illness and tension and stress. Now, heart rate versus activity. It's important to measure physical activity in order to evaluate changes of the heart rate. If you don't know what a person's actually doing physically, you can't make an assessment on what their ECG or what their heart rate is telling you. You, you need this contextual data. So as our heart rate launches off the charts here, it's important to know that the person, oh, should have done a translation there. Laufen is running in, in German, just for you know a quick educational aside. They've gone for a run. So here they're active. They're probably doing some sort of warm-up, getting prepared. And now they're off for a run. Paused for a little bit here, just walking along, running again. And then you can see the steady sort of recovery. Like they're just sitting and standing the rest of this time. And you can see, though, that their heart rate's you know relatively elevated for a while. There's a little bit of a lay-down period here, which you can see then results in a lower. You know, a lowering back to sort of, a, I guess, a more of a normal baseline throughout the day. And then you can see as the time changes throughout the day, like we get to here, I'd say, is time that they've gotten ready for bed, you know, sitting on the couch in the evening, and now it's time in bed, and their body's winding down, and the parasympathetic is taking more and more control, lowering their heart rate as they fall into a lovely, relaxing, refreshing, rejuvenating sleep until the alarm goes at around, well, what, 8.45. So when we actually talk about heart rate variability, what, what we're talking about is the modulation of the heart rate by the autonomic nervous system. So both branches of the autonomic nervous system. So it's the fluctuation of successive RR intervals. So to the R peak in our QRS waveform, we will we'll go through in a, in a little moment, but what you need is precise R peak detection to detect this. So you need millisecond resolution at least to get an accurate calculation. Autonomic regulation takes place via the sinus node. So that we're looking at normal strokes only, so the NN intervals, so the time that's occurring between these particular R peaks. So we take our ECG signal to calculate this, and we look for the, R, the QRS waveform. So here we see that that's the Q as it sort of uh, Oh, that's actually the P wave, sorry. And then there's the Q as it drops down. Then we have the R peak, which is the clearest, like the strongest electrical signal. So it's the one that we can zoom in on the most and get the most accurate information. And then we come down for the R, yes, and then there's the T wave at the end. We detect these R peaks, so we have to look at them. And you can see there's some lovely sort of spacing here, which represents variability. You filter out for the end beat. So this is the time that's actually occurring between the beats. So uh, our interbeat intervals or NN intervals, and you can see here they're represented in milliseconds and they should be changing. You don't want anything metronomic. And, and you can see that represented here in the NN list. See the drop and then the increase in variability as it goes into a more relaxed state. And the heart rate per minute, if you're averaging that out, should be changing at, at every point along the way. Now, to actually calculate heart rate variability, you need to look at a segment over time. You can't just look at an individual beat, but it doesn't tell you any information. So you have to have some sort of segmentation and there's some virtue in a lot of different approaches. Some people like to look at things like a 30 second window, some are two minutes, some think five minutes is the minimum. There's, there's a lot of literature out there on that concept and we've kind of adopted, I guess, a a compromise of two minutes for a lot of our calculations just to find a, a, a way of displeasing everyone, you know, but displeasing everyone as minimally as possible um, because you just, in science, you just cannot please everyone, unfortunately. But you take this segmentation, you validate your RP detections, you detrend it, and then you will get your calculation, you will get these statistical parameters that will come out. So you have time domain ones, which are the standard deviation between the NNs, then you have the standard deviation of the successive differences, so the differences between those beats. 
you can then broaden it out like with some like a fast Fourier transformation into spectral parameters. So in the frequency range, so you've got the power in the high frequency range, which is generally considered to be 0.15 to 0.4 hertz. And then the power in the low frequency range of 0.04 to 0.15 hertz. And then the ratio between those two. So you have all sorts of different geometric or non-linear parameters as well. So parameters from the Poincaré plot. And we'll just have a quick look at, the, I guess, the parasympathetic tone here. You can see here in the high frequency range, which is generally when, you're talking about measuring the, uh, the parasympathetic system, you're looking at high frequency heart rate vari variability. So you're looking in this zone. The parasympathetic and the sympathetic are working a lot down here. It's not something that you can very much isolate, but you can see here a complete reduction of the parasympathetic in this sympathetic tone example, and a lovely bump down here in the low frequency spectrum, which sort of tells you that the brake has been lifted, the sympathetic system is engaged. Now, how reciprocal that is, is debatable, but it's when you when you have this sort of tool, this is the, the best option you can, you can strive for. So you can see that the parasympathetic is in no way engaged. You can see a spike within the low frequency. So you know that there is definitely got to be some engagement of the sympathetic nervous system here. And when it comes to the parasympathetic tone and the sympathetic tone, we have to remember also it's like, the great scientist Eddie Van Halen said, volume is tone. This is more to do with the, the constituent parts of the frequency and their intensity, whereas heart rate variability, when you're examining that, that's more to do with, say, like the equivalent of like a tremolo effect, so the, uh, an oscillation and the way it oscillates. So you might want to have some terrible style oscillation like Angus Young's vibrato, for instance, when he does a solo. And as the token Australian in the company, I'm allowed to slag off ACDC. I reserve that right in the same way that my German colleagues roll their eyes whenever the scorpions are mentioned. So the heart rate variability spectrogram represents the distribution of heart rate variability in the different frequency bands for the entire measurement. It's a really excellent tool for visualization of what's actually happening throughout the entire day. So if we look at the, the time on the clock here, obviously the device wasn't worn at certain periods. And then you can see overnight, you, you would, you're seeing a very large activation, like a much more powerful activation of the high frequency in, in the parasympathetic as, as someone's resting and recovering. To calculate this, we, you ta we're taking slices in two minute epochs and taking the power of those different frequencies and representing it in a color scale and you know, swinging that around here. Heart rate variability, low frequency to high frequency ratio describes the ratio of activity in the low frequency band to the activity in the high frequency band. And you can see the different sort of ratio here. So the low frequency and the high frequency and as the different sort of time plot throughout the day as to what's happening, what the ratio is between the two different frequency bands. And once again, a two minute epochs used to calculate that and the calculation of the area under the curve in high frequency and low frequency and a determination of the ratio. And then we come over here and we slice that all together rather beautifully. And to compare the two, this, this sort of gives you that illustration of the, throughout the day, the different elements of behavior and the different sort of activations of both the low frequency, high frequency behavior and the high heart rate variability spectrogram and yeah, especially interesting that the sleep periods when you really notice that the changeover and the crossover to that rest and recovery phase. So application examples of heart rate variability and, and its measurement. So mentioned before, stress-oriented load control in endurance sports, making sure athletes don't train themselves into the ground. And so, and also regeneration and training regulation in sports. Therapy control for cancer patients, once again, seeing what they're up for, where their, where their adaptability is, so that you're not applying too many stresses. You know, understanding mental and physical stress under various conditions, epilepsy detection, and reflective learning. So we'll just have a quick look at some of the different, I guess, interpretations of things you might see. So for someone who's you know, quite relaxed, um, you know, it's probably pre-COVID, you can see their heart frequency, it's the, the actual heart rate itself, 
goes through a regular sort of cycle throughout the day, relatively relaxed at night, and, and also relatively relaxed in the evening. So I guess, you know, the work day is done. Um, that must, must have been their, you know, post-meal meditation or something, and then relaxed all throughout the evening through to the, through to the following sort of morning. Now, someone very relaxed, you know, obviously they probably don't have kids, it's pre-COVID, you know, part-time work that sort of thing, you can see a lot more, um, you're a lot less, I guess, stress activation. So in this case, it was someone that was exercising at a certain point because you can see they kind of went off the charts a little bit and probably the, 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 took the sensor off whilst they did it and then had a shower afterwards and then put it back on. And then you can see like they're, they're really, their stress index is really high, like they've really pushed themselves physically, but then they've got high adaptability, they've returned to baseline quite rapidly, they're down here already. And you can see that they've recovered really well in the evening and they're very much in a relaxing sort of state. Um, it's probably they're getting ready for bed and then very much deep into a nice restful sort of recovery and sleep here. Stressed out, so this is probably what we're all looking like um, at the moment after 12 months of lockdowns and other various restrictions in our lives and we don't really see a huge amount of I guess what we can infer as parasympathetic activity, it's, it's a lot of very low grade constant stresses uh, that we're all experiencing at the moment, which is, as we know, is, is probably worse than just a, an acute stressor. It's, it's the long term stressed out, which I, I, I'm very worried for the person whose chart this is. It's not an excellent, it's a, it's a, it's a warning sign sort of chart that you're having too much daily stresses, not enough time to actually relax and take stock and reflect. Now, a com quick comparison here between ECG and PPG. So photophlesmography is what's utilized in the devices that you wear on your wrist. And <laughs> I won't go on too much about this. It is kind of like my favorite sort of whipping horse and I do like to beat this dead horse endlessly. But I, I don't, if you're serious about heart rate variability, you want the clarity of the R peaks from an ECG signal. If you need to calculate something like total peripheral resistance or, or something like pulse wave velocity, that the then yes, a, a PPG signal is good in addition to an ECG signal. On its own, uh, if you can find a clearly defined point there across the top like so here we've got maybe 700 milliseconds approximately between beats you know 700 to a to a thousand whereas here we have these broader waves across the top so you could be anything up to 10 to 20 milliseconds out depending on what point you pick there's no really clearly defined point as such so any device that's trying to calculate heart rate variability using photophlesmography has some inherent limitations. I won't. I want to say it's rubbish, but I won't say that. I'll say it just has inherent limitations of one movement artifacts because you're measuring at the peripheral of the body, so any movement at all will have an influence. Whereas if you're measuring purely the electrical signal of the heart, you don't have that problem. I mean, you you will have artifacts that will cause noise. However you'll be able to see that visually quite clearly. You'll actually see a disturbance in your ECG waveform, and then you can isolate that out and actually get rid of it in your analysis. Whereas in PPG, you don't know whether the increase or like the, I guess the shortening of the waveforms, like the distance between the waveforms is caused by movement or by the heart itself, like by the action of the, the body. And now, We'll just go on to a little video. This is my, my pre-COVID body that I'm working on getting back to. And we'll just do a little video now on attaching the ECG Move 4. So when we're using the ECG Move 4, it's really important that there's no hair on the skin that will prevent good electro contact. And to clean the sites with an oil or grease free soap and water or with alcohol wipes to make sure you're going to get a really good connection. So any sort of hair, any body creams, any lotions that, have that sort of uh, you know, have a fatty residue, um, they will act as a resistor for a good electrical signal to pass through the skin to the actual device. So it's really important to go through these steps. 
clean it, make sure it's really thoroughly dry as well. And here are the locations. So when using the electrodes, it's actually in the center of the chest, just at the sternum, and then over to the left-hand side. So the sensor is actually slightly offset uh, from the center of the body, whereas when you're using the belt, the center the sensor will be in the center of the body just for, for comfort. Um, in this case, we're using just the disposable electrodes, and you can see they're sort of more the butterfly-style arrangements. They flare out. You have to remove these clear plastic uh, tabs, and there's also some other little bits of um, plastic that help sort of the sensor grip that get removed. And then at the exact center point with the first electrode and then over to the left-hand side of the body with the other electrode. And that's the process. And they should last, uh, they should endure quite a lot. They should actually stay on the skin for a good 24 hour period. And now finally, what probably a lot of you have been waiting for quite eagerly, and uh, I believe it's very much well worth the wait, is our best practice session with Professor Dr. Andreas Schwertfeger. Hi, my name is Andreas Schwertfeger from the University of Graz. Um, and I'm very uh, happy to um, have the opportunity to present uh, to you our most recent research on HRV within this webinar. Uh, and in doing so, I will later consult my postdoc and um, colleague Christian Rominger to share some more methodological details uh, with you. Uh, so I will now start the presentation and hope that you uh, can see it in a very short time. All right. Uh, so the title of our presentation is a bit long. It's a bit pathetic maybe. Uh, it is Feelings from the Heart, Developing an Interactive Psychophysiological Assessment to Trigger Smartphone Prompts from Transient Decrements of Heart Rate Variability. So our main aim uh, is uh, to use heart rate variability as collected in everyday life um, in different situations to predict relevant psychosocial states. Um, and um, um, this is quite quite a recent approach, however, with a quite long tradition behind it. I will turn to this uh, later on. Uh, so first of all, um, when you um, think of heart rate variability, you might think of uh, its health relevance, right? And you already heard within this webinar about the details of HRV. And this is just a reminder, this slide, uh, for us to, to remember that heart rate variability actually uh, has a predictive utility for health and for longevity, for mortality, and, and so on. So there's quite a large amount of research suggesting that this is an interesting variable to look at. Um, when we now turn to um, the mechanisms behind heart rate variability. I will make this very, very brief because you have already heard about that. Um, is the, um, heart rate is usually uh, higher as we can observe it in, in the laboratory. So usually when you disconnect the heart from the autonomic nervous system, it beats around 80 beats per minute. When you then connect it again, uh, you have a heart rate of approximately 60 to 70 beats per minute in adults. Right? In children, it's, it's higher. And uh, this uh, innovation of the autonomic nervous system can then be quantified as this variability of successive heartbeats, for example. The interesting thing now for us as psychologists is um, that there is a really fast connection between the heart and the brain, and especially between the heart and the prefrontal cortex, uh, which is primarily mediated through the myelinated uh, vagus nerve. And it remits the signals very, very fast. And therefore, we have a strong interaction between the heart and the brain, and the brain and the heart, and so on. Um, now, when you look at the uh, research in HRV in our field, uh, you find a lot of different concepts related to HRV, right? And this is 
something that is on the one side quite quite nice to see so many different concepts are related to HRV but on the other hand the specificity of HRV and maybe also its validity can be challenged because it's it's actually a kind of umbrella variable that combines all different aspects of health and anxiety and depression and social support up to resilience right and uh, in our own research we focused on several of these concepts um, that you see here with with uh, mark with green circles um, and i will not uh, reiterate our our research on, on these areas um, but just uh, want to uh, uh, make sure that you know that we we did this kind of research in the laboratory and in the field using um, ecological momentary assessment and usually we use a time sampling design as you will see here um, we assemble data across one day up to three days maybe five days and longer um, and we um, aim for quite uh, high sampling rate so we aim to ask uh, our participants approximately every 45 minutes or approximately every hour about their feeling states and record um, the ECG um, and therefore heart rate variability uh, continuously. Right? And then we ask individuals via this MovieSense XS software, for example, about the feeling state, about their self-esteem, social interactions, positive, negative affect, and so on. And what we usually do is uh, when we ask them at these random points in time, then we analyze a period of approximately five minutes prior to each prompt and analyze HRV and bodily movement. Right? So our usual aim is to um, predict heart rate variability by controlling for bodily movement and uh, trying uh, to associate um, this heart rate variability with different psychosocial states. All right, so uh, this is a traditional time sampling design, uh, random time periods we ask and then analyze a time period of five minutes prior to each prompt. Why five minutes? Nobody really knows why this is a reasonable time frame. It's, it's a time frame that can be uh, quite quite nicely judged at because you have quite an overview of what happens uh, in the last five minutes but you could also think of three minutes seven minutes ten minutes uh, I don't know so um, the, the main advantage of such an approach is that um, you have a more or less random sampling um, of um, the feeling states and therefore also of uh, associated psychophysiological variables and movements uh, so it, it could be quite quite nice to generalize um, to the everyday life of a participant, right? Uh, however, um, there might be interesting periods uh, where, for example, heart rate variability is strongly increasing or is, is uh, declining that might be of utmost interest for us. And uh, by a random sampling, you just miss uh, these occasions, right? And therefore, an alternative is this interactive psychophysiological assessment where you have here essentially the same signal as we discussed in the previous slide, which is presented here above. But now you really aim to detect periods of heart rate variability decreases and associate it with a certain uh, psychosocial assessment and then you compare these periods to randomly collected periods throughout a day or multiple days. So this is the idea of an interactive psychophysiological assessment and actually uh, this idea is quite an old one uh, which uh, was uh, originally developed in the mid-1990s uh, by the research group in Freiburg um, uh, Professor Fahrenberg and Mürtek, who developed such an interactive assessment with respect to heart rate. So they called it an additional heart rate when heart rate increased, which was not due to bodily movement, physical activity. Um, then it was meant to index a kind of uh, cognitive or emotional 
state of the individual. Right? And this has been picked up by a very nice colleagues uh, from the Netherlands, uh, University of Leiden in the Netherlands, um, especially Bart Berkeu and, and colleagues who um, apply this approach now to heart rate variability. That means they uh, try to detect uh, changes in heart rate variability in everyday life and then connect these changes to psychosocial states, right? So coming from the physiological signals to learn about the psychosocial state of an individual. Uh, such an algorithm is actually not that easy, um, but it is available from, from movie sense and it can be developed further and, and get, get more, more refined and, and so on. So usually the rationale behind this is that you have a moving average procedure, for example, across 30 seconds and continuously analyze heart rate variability, then also continuously analyze the amount of physical activity, right? And ideally you might also want to control for body posture or other things like respiration and so on. So I'm not, I, I will not uh, present the details about this body posture and, and respiration and so on, but this is just to tell you that there are several opportunities for further developing uh, such algorithms, right? Taking more and more covariates into account. Um, so with, uh, by means of this algorithm, the, its sensitivity needs to be adjusted for each individual, right? Because for each individual, the relationship between bodily movement and HRV might be somehow different. And each individual might have a different uh, um, variability of heart rate variability, right? So some, some individuals might rather stay at a rather, um, stable level, whereas others might fluctuate quite strongly and so on. So we need to adjust uh, these uh, algorithms for every individual. This is an example of an algorithm. I will not go too much into detail about this algorithm. Uh, the algorithms are provided by uh, MovieSense, which is really nice. And uh, they are also um, quite keen on, on uh, further refinements and, and uh, further research with, with regard to these uh, algorithms. You will hear later from, from my colleague a bit more about uh, this, these algorithms. So what, what's important maybe to consider? So a single episode, uh, that means one segment of one minute, for example, or 30 seconds or whatever you like, of uh, such an HRV decrease might not be that relevant um, for a psychosocial state, right? Uh, it depends. We do not really know whether these very, very uh, short-lived uh, decreases are really of interest or not. So future research will tell us, but maybe um, um, a more massive amount of HRV decreases might be more interesting, right? So we need to define a sequence uh, that we aim to analyze uh, in a specific time frame, right? So which time frame are we going to analyze and how many HRV decreases we want to detect or make sure that they are within these uh, uh, time periods? Right, to trigger the psychosocial prompt. So we need to decide on a window length. This is one thing that is very important. So how many segments of one minute, for example, should be analyzed. Um, and then uh, the RMSSD window threshold. So how often in these segments should HRV decreases occur to trigger a prompt? These are two um, uh, dimensions that could be um, specified or should be specified. There are many, many more uh, uh, variables that are yet unsure. Uh, for example, how long should the trigger be set silent, the silence mode, until the next trigger is evoked, right? And how strong should these decreases actually be? So is this uh, um, um, two standard deviations uh, below the usual calibrated RMSSD value of an individual? Is it a half standard deviation? Is it two standard errors? Uh, 
anything like that. So uh, there is uh, a lot to be done uh, in, in research to figure this out. So in short, uh, there are many, many unknown parameters and how to solve this uh, complexity. <laughs> and this is what we actually did, simulations. Right? We used an already published data set on HRV and quality of social interactions that we collected across three consecutive days. Uh, uh, for using these simulations, um, we had quite, quite an excessive uh, amount of data loss, actually, because we use all the information available between the prompts, right? So individuals got triggered about every 45 minutes to one hour. Um, and we need to have all the HRV and physical activity data available, not just a five minutes prior each prompt, but across the three days, more or less. So uh, we had a limited sample size here of good quality data of 21 participants. And we asked them about the uh, perceived quality of social interaction. So whenever social interactions occurred, we asked them about the uh, close perceived closeness, the balance of the relationship, warmth and supportive value. And we applied generalizability theory analysis, analysis, another fancy thing that you can do when you have this ecological momentary assessment data to calculate within person reliability. So how reliable is the change within persons in this variable? And also between person reliability, which is a quite equivalent to the classical Kronbach's alpha, right? which was very, very good. Uh, and we uh, used uh, the uh, ECG Move 4 device uh, from MovieSense. So we used a two-step approach. The first step uh, is a simulation of the individual um, add, add additional HRV reduction triggers for each person. So we need really to make sure that uh, this trigger is adjusted now for each person. Uh, that means bodily movement and HRV are differently related for each individual. So we need to um, uh, find out how strong is the association for each person. And therefore we calculate a regression for the calibration of the algorithm. And this is usually done within uh, 12 uh, hours, so uh, approximately the first day of our recording now is used for this uh, regression um, uh, calculation and this uh, individual calibration of the algorithm. Right. There have, has been uh, uh, research on, on this calibration period by the colleagues uh, uh, from the Netherlands, uh, Bart Verkuy and, and colleagues, and they arrived at uh, a calibration period of approximately one day, 12 hours, uh, maybe also 24 hours, uh, which is quite, quite good and a good period to calibrate these algorithms. And then in a second uh, a step, uh, we simulated the trigger sensitivity to psychosocial states which means actually that um, we um, now calculate associations between the different settings of the trigger and uh, uh, the uh, psychosocial variables that I just presented. So the quality of social interactions. And actually we used uh, these triggers then to predict the quality of the social interactions. And we expected that uh, lower quality social interactions should be somehow accompanied by lower HRV or by yeah, HRV decrements, right? So this way we can now evaluate the sensitivity of the algorithms with respect to different time periods, uh, different uh, windows uh, of, of RMSSD, window threshold and time segments. We can manipulate this and really run different simulations to see which trigger settings are really most useful and most powerful to predict psychosocial states, right? So when there is a difference between this um, evoked 
trigger uh, and its relation to psychosocial states as compared to randomly set triggers, right? To no, no, no relevant HRV decrease triggers. Then we have information about the sensitivity of this trigger. We did this uh, simulations by mixed effects modeling with bootstrap simulations. And now my uh, dear colleague, uh, Christian Rominger, who has actually done all these uh, uh, fancy simulations, will now uh, present you some of the details of this approach. That's from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas, for your introduction. I will describe how we can come up with different algorithm settings which will work or might work in an online mode. So first of all, we have to collect EMA data and this can be done with MovieSense 6S and the ECG Move 4 and the applied um, software of MovieSense. So, we can design an EMA study with prompts uh, which are regular or random and ask for positive effect, ask for quality of social interactions and so forth. Additionally, we can uh, assess and record continuous ECG information, movement information, as well as additional information like body position. Then we get, yeah, continuous RMSST information, movement information, and the associated prompts. So in the first step of the simulation, we can do a simulation of individual triggers. This is the logic of the algorithm implemented in MovieSense. First of all, we have as described before, continuous one-minute segments of RMSST information and movement acceleration information. Based on a one-day assessment of RMSST and movement, we can calculate uh, the RMSST prediction. Then we come up with a slope and an intercept. Here, I have an example of one person with the different movement acceleration the person showed throughout the day and the R associated RMSSD. By calculating a regression analysis, we can find a linear regression formula, which tells us the association about RMSSD and movement acceleration, so we can predict RMSSD due to movement. With this, inf with this information, we can now calculate each single meaningful RMSSD decrease. And this is defined as um, each case when the predicted RMSSD is lower when this is the case when the actual RMSSD is lower than the predicted RMSSD minus a defined threshold. But this is not enough for us to trigger a meaningful additional heart rate variability reduction. So we need further algorithm settings. So first of all, we have the window length and the threshold. The window length is the time period we are looking at and the threshold defines how many minute, one minute segment, segments have to be meaningful RMSSD decreases that uh, the algorithm would fire. So this is an example for one individual simulation. The blue lines are the HRV and the green lines are the predicted RMSSD minus the defined threshold. And all black marks show meaningful RMSSD decreases, and the green ones are the simulated triggers. Um, yes, and each single, each single setting 
will result in another distribution over time of these trigger settings of these delivered triggers so we run a simulation on at step one a simulation of individual triggers for each setting and then we can use this information to, sim to simulate the sensitivity of the additional heart rate variability reduction trigger the step two we predicted the social quality of interaction with different algorithm settings in total we had 435 different combinations of RMSSD window length and RMSSD window threshold. And for all these combinations, we used a multi-level model, which predicts the quality of a social interaction in our sample uh, by means of the information of trigger absent or present before the prompt was delivered. All of these 435 multi-level models were bootstrapped with 1000 iterations. And this method allows to calculate the power of the trigger settings by calculating the number of times uh, we come up with significant multi-level models compared to the total uh, times of iterations. And what we can uh, see finally is a graph which shows the power of all 435 combinations of trigger settings. And this yellow peak are the settings with the highest power and the highest the best setting in this case is a setting with a rmssd window length with 29 minutes and a threshold of 30 minutes with a total power of 0.81 which means that about 81 percent of all multi-level models were significant so this was a short introduction how to run a simulation study of different algorithm settings thank you very much for your attention thank you so much andreas and christian for that presentation and we're coming to the conclusion now of our webinar, but there's still some time for questions and answers. If you have any questions, please write them in the chat window at the moment, and we will answer them as they come in as best as we can. So whilst some of you are hopefully writing some questions, the, uh, the rest of you are busily writing down our details, which you can find on our website to get in touch with us about solutions for your own projects and different ideas. We're more than happy to go with you from the conceptualized sort of stage through to testing out the idea and implementing it and guide you through the process. And we have a range of really nice experts here who can help you with any stage of the project. Now we're going to cross back live for the Q&A section.